website. And we are um, looking forward to our presentations today from Brett Eddy and Elena Imbach about working in this new environment. Um, you can always find information about resources and it's a changing landscape on the KETA website, kitsapeda.org. Then if you go to that main page, you'll see the COVID-19 banner there and you just pull it down. You'll see there all the resources that we have available. And Teresa, I think we're ready for our first poll. So we're just getting it set up. So we just want to see, as we did last week, who is here today, what kind of um, company do you represent or organization? OK. And this was similar to last week, lots of professional services, but sprinkling of other things as well. And then our second poll. Has your job been affected by COVID-19? Directly, somewhat, not affected. Not directly, but my job security has dropped, or not at all. Okay, so most of us on, on this webinar today do have some significant impacts. And then Teresa, there's one more poll before we start, correct? So now we're starting to get into our topics of the day. How do you feel about technology? Tech is causing more problems than doing good. Tech intimidates me. I would love to dive in, but don't know where to start. I can get around okay, but not confident in my skills or knowledge. I would love the idea of a career or company in tech. Okay. We have predictions. Oh. Okay, so we have people who are doing okay, but they need some training or some self confidence. I think a lot of people can do more than they think they can. And with that, I am going to um, turn over the first section of today's webinar to Mr. Brett Eddy, who's going to give us some of his always good to hear insights. So take it away, Brett. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Let me share my screen here in Zoom. All right. Um, I should be sharing. Um, so what we want to talk about today is a little bit about um, our current situation. We're inundated by COVID, whether it's the news or social media or anywhere else. I want us to be sure that we take a moment and we sort of acknowledge that. And however, um, I don't want us to focus on it. So, but just a couple slides. I want to. I want us to talk about um, first. Let's take a moment to grieve um, because it's almost impossible to address the future, to address self improvement without kind of understanding where we are. I pulled up some stats here. Um, so many March jobs are one month net change. Um, you can see this map on the left. The estimated job loss due to coronavirus by the summer coming forward. So the reality is we're in this unprecedented time. Um, I, and I thought of what's the best metaphor? And, and I had to think about the Black Gate speech from Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. So for all of my um, science fiction and um, um, you know epic adventure fans out there, you know exactly what this, this particular scene is about. 
So the whole army um, is going to the Black Gate to, to um, help out Frodo and Samwise, but in reality, they're just surrounded. So, so in some ways, we feel that way. We feel like there's nothing that we can do about this space we're in. But today we fight. So what I wanna do is I wanna give you just a little bit of permission, just a little bit of time to put it to the side, to be able, be able to focus with your tribe, the people who care about your success, and let's just dive into um, what we can do about it. So um, we're gonna talk about creating value. So the first one thing that I wanted to mention is that you just are more than your job. So when we talk about job security, um, we, we can talk about, we wanna identify problems that need to be solved. Um, I wanna encourage you that you can create the solutions to the problems you identify. But also uh, understand that even tackling a problem to solve makes you personally stronger. And the reason that's important is it creates, lets you be stronger, but it also demonstrates to potential new hiring managers that you can think outside of the box, that you can build solutions um, that are going to make a difference. So uh, if, if there were that one course as a college professor I would want to teach, it's about problem identification. So we do that through a couple ways. We observe, we ask, and we begin to solve. The best way to solve this is finding a friend, doing it with them to be able to find this tribe that can help you do some things together. Um, begin to identify it. But here's what you want to avoid. Avoid criticizing or complaining. Really avoid condemning. We have so many people around us that do that. Elena is going to talk about the community a little bit at Vibe, and that's one of the things that is just a precious resource that we have up at Vibe Coworks, is that this ability to, to gather around, whether that is at that common lunch table or grabbing a friend and going into one of the conference rooms, we actually just love um, identifying these problems, coming up with a solution. They could be local in nature, they could be Kitsap focused, but they could also be national solutions. Um, I, I have some dear friends that are working on environmental uh, concerns globally. Well, all of us have a vested interest to make sure that we do well there. We just can't lose that battle. So also, let me give you a little bit of, um, of encouragement. The following logos that you see here, these are started during the 2008 recession. So there's gonna be un, um, a, just this incredible value proposition that's gonna be created right now. I'm, my whole career has been in tech. I love technology. Um, here's a couple of stats that might blow your mind. 50 billion computers and devices are connected by, to the internet by 2020. 50 billion with a B. So that is an unbelievable way to engage, to connect, to build community, and to really solve problems. So here's another great stat, 320 million new devices. New devices are connected to the internet each month. So the ability to reach through your, your small sphere of influence to those who are connected online is a really powerful, powerful thing. So really, what do we need to know about this? So I'm gonna walk through a couple things and I wanna throw out a common belief and then I want to expand that a little bit. Is technology gonna kill your job or is technology gonna help you love your job? So if you do it right, tech can help you with this amazing brain power, this supercomputer that you have in your skull can help you solve problems, be better, serve more people and do better for the sphere of influence you live in. Um, this is an interesting quote. So tech, when we do some work in Startup Kitsap, when we're talking to founders, we're talking to people who are creating value, tech is a gen the generator that powers innovation, growth, and breakthroughs, virtually every sector of the economy. You can read the quote, but there's really no particular place that tech isn't impacting, whether it's restaurants, or whether it's teaching, whether it's healthcare, telemedicine, you name it. So if you're, I'm really encouraged that at our, our um, previous poll, it was shown that you're really tech optimists. There are other people who are tech pessimists and, and they're just hanging on to the past. The tech optimists tend to be the ones that are, that are taking the future by storm. Now, granted, I'll be the first one to share that there are so many people who are creating useless apps on phones, but there's an awful lot of people who are solving real problems in, in every sector that we know about, teaching and connections and, and healthcare. Um, that's everything, things that we live with and that we care about. So in Washington State, let me show you some interesting stats. So the percentage of the workforce in Washington State, um, we're third in um, state ranking, but look at this. In the average Kitsap wage is roughly around 67K per year. 
But in tech, whether it's just a W-2 job or it's an entrepreneur, the opportunity just for wages alone is so much more significant than that which we have as an average in our very county. Um, a lot of us at Kita talk about this. We want to improve this stat. So there are some areas where you can see my little um, thing over on the, on the right side, and it really talks about um, is this glass half full or is this glass half, half empty? Well, at the end of the day, a machine may not take your job, but one could become your boss. It's kind of an interesting thought of what if AI, what if the organization, what if scheduling can be done better by a computer? Could that become my boss? Well, probably not. I mean, this is a little bit of an um, um, intellectual argument. But there are a bunch of jobs that are displaced by tech. So you, when you look at, through these long haul truck drivers, um, healthcare workers, customer services and assistance, I think about going to a fast food restaurant where there's a person who used to help me and now it's a kiosk. Or if you think at a Starbucks, I'm ordering my, my coffee on my phone and I'm picking it up. A lot of those things are good things. I would love for the smart brain power of these people to be put into an area that actually can be um, fascinating, that can leverage their, their tremendous supercomputer in the skull. And I would love to see some of the, the education show up that enables that. So at the same time that some jobs are lost, 3.5 million jobs are created. So if you think about that, tech is actually creating more jobs than it's taking away. This audience is great because you're technology optimists, and so you probably get it. Um, so really reinvention, I think, is fundamentally a good thing. Um, you, you need to choose to love to learn. That's something that those of us are in tech, we are learning constantly. Um, there are some people who just want to learn a skill and repeat the same skill. Well, tech is a little bit tough place to, to make an education or to be an entrepreneur. But if you love to learn, tech is awesome. So you need to find a tribe that encourages you to risk, to try things. And then really just to build, 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 build. So um, here, here's a common belief that we're all getting dumber with tech. The, the truth is sort of, you know, in a lot of ways, we're forgetting a lot of the trivia. But at the same time, we're all getting a little bit smarter with tech. So how many times have you been talking to somebody and you ask a question and their first answer is, you can go to Google, you can pull out your smartphone, you can look this up. So um, we can all do that. So in a lot of ways, tech is making us smarter. Um, but it's also a little bit true on both. We're losing some trivial things, but we're, it's enabling us. It's almost like being bionic in some ways. So sometimes, um, you know, tech might be feel overrated. But there are those of us who just love technology as a living, as a, an ability to solve problems, as a, an ability to reach global um, solutions, to partner with people, a new tribe all over the nation. You can partner up and, and we're gonna talk about how to do some of that. So fundamentally, at the end of the day, is tech making the world a better place? Yes, but it's, uh, I love this quote from uh, Albert Einstein. It has become appallingly obvious that our tech has sometimes exceeded our humanity. So a person who's known for his brain power um, drops a pearl of wisdom so across the ages we can appreciate this statement. So uh, let me give you a couple of stats. We talked about this uh, when we had a presentation with Olympic College that, um, that is important for us to remember that life expectancy is actually rising. Um, and then sometimes, um, we also need to think about education. Well, are people, you know, with, with technology and access to the internet, is that actually coming, um, is that helping or, or hindering? Well, in across the world, uh, more people are going to school for longer. So they're getting a higher education. They're, they're, they're participating in a little more of a global economy, but that's happening because of some of the technology innovations. Uh, access to the internet is rising as well. So the internet access isn't in and of itself a game changer. But what it does is it enables the game to be changed by the access to the very information that can make a difference in their lives. If they can learn skills or business principles or connect with markets, that can change their lives forever. It can get them out of poverty and it can help them to provide for their family. Um, it can help them to connect with people that could make a difference like you and me. We can actually be mentors to people around the world. If we take, if we get out of our own lens, if we step in that and, and commit to help. So um, I put forward that sort of gnarly problems plus great solutions plus committed people can equal success. I had to, when I was creating the slides, I had to sort of modify that. I had to say, 
this can lead to success. If we, if we don't improve ourselves, that it's not going to equal success. But doing the thing, building the entrepreneurship, going after some bigger solutions can definitely equal success. So proximity, finally, proximity really matters. Um, one of the things I want to talk about really quickly is um, a couple of initiatives and companies that, that I've been um, able to help with. SnapGig is a gig economy web app. Um, we, when we decided to go big on SnapGig, we created this team and we, we um, I put staffed and propelled at Vibe. It wasn't founded at Vibe. We, we had the, the idea and then I synced up with this company. But SnapGig, and you go to snapgig.com and you can learn about them. Um, we actually, we got together and we worked out some of those issues. And then we had to really think about how do we connect to this two-sided marketplace? It's a tougher challenge because we have to get the providers, and those are the workers, and then we have to connect to the, the supply side or the dem demand side, the marketplace. So we had to connect these. Well, by doing that, then there's a, a handful of us, some of my business partners, we created a, a LLC called Heroic Development. So what we do is we have mobile, we build mobile apps and, and we're experts at building websites and web applications that are mobile responsive. We're experts in e-commerce and, and uh, helping companies take their offering to the cloud. So we like to call ourselves your software development partners. And in that, if you need to reach a global audience, if you need to reach a national audience, if you don't understand SEO, heck, some of, some of us don't even know how to spell SEO. But um, that really, you need to have a software person on your side that can speak your business, that's empathetic, that's not talking at you. So because of our proximity at Vibe, we were, we like to say heroic development was birthed at Vibe. We said, hey, you know, we have proximity. We're, we're solving problems together. We're starting to understand that we can make a difference locally. We can make a difference regionally in the Puget Sound. Um, we can actually make a difference nationally because in tech, borders really don't matter. Um, the fact that there, our ferry is just right there, that's not a criticality for our kind of, uh, of work and in, in the, the kind of solutions we create in the world. Um, so I would encourage all of us just to really think about how can you find your tribe? Um, how can you, uh, in this COVID world, we're, we're kind of stuck. We're, we're all stuck in our home. There's, there's the laughter about, you know, can people cut, you know, how am I gonna get my hair cut? Well, for some of us, it's not an issue. But um, for a lot of other people, you know, that's, that's a significant deal. But how can you connect to the right people to do problem identification, to create solutions? And by doing so, how can you document that? But even if you're going to just need another job, if you lost your job, building something makes you even more attractive to the next manager. It makes you stronger, just like lifting or, or, or running. Um, so let me encourage you. The worst place to be is despondent. The best place to be for yourself and for the world is to be building. In tech, anybody can pick up a, a browser, anybody can go to some resources, and you can become stronger, better, and faster. And I would argue you could even serve the world through tech perhaps better than you could without it. So really, at the, where I want to end us with is what if this is a golden time for innovation? What if this is a great time? All of those billion dollar companies were started in 2008 at the recession. Right now, we live in this unprecedented world where more people are out of work as we speak. So I will guarantee you, we're going to look back a year from now, and we're going to say that company started then. That company is starting right now. And each of us have the opportunity to grab a problem, start creating a solution, and it could be your time. It could be your time entrepreneurially to get something going, to, sa to save this world, to start saving your community, to make yourself better, stronger, and faster. Now is the golden time for innovation. So let's, let's be about it. And with that, I was committed to 15 minutes and I think I just nailed it. So thanks. Here's how you can find me and would love to hear from you. Kathy, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, Teresa, I think we'll just see if we can take a couple of those questions. We're doing well on time. Uh, do you see those, Brett? So for Entrepreneurs, what would your recommendation for leveraging technology for any industry be from a skills development and education area? I love that from, from Dan, who always asks really good probing questions. Um, so uh, for entrepreneurs, recommendation for leveraging tech, 
Uh, if you go over to startupkitsapp.com, we actually created a page where we said, here's some of the best tools. So I think those, the technology like Zoom, Uber Conference, some of the collaborative software, even some of the marketing software will help you um, to be able to reach out. If you're an entrepreneur is all the way very back at the beginning and you actually need to just say, hmm, I want to get into tech. I want to reinvent myself. What's a good way to do that? There, um, there's a good, there are several groups. Um, in fact, if you connect with Elena at Vibe, there's a bunch of subgroups that are sort of meeting and talking about this. That would be a good way to start. Um, there's an awful lot of online resources. The, one of the challenges is in tech is there's so much. There's, you know, we invented the internet. So, um, you know, the, the, the technical people who took the, the, the next stage from all the governments and all the education institutions and the internet as we know it, there's no problem of content. The problem is what's the right content for me? So having that conversation with some people who are good at that is, is really good, I, I think would be helpful. So I'm seeing another one um, from Teresa. You want me to just go through these, Kathy? Is that the easiest? Sure. Okay, so, uh, oh, I see. So Teresa is asking to the, the attendees, I'll skip that one. Um, from Catherine, uh, we need to talk about the upper, upper under representation of black and Latino community in tech. Not everyone has equal access to tech jobs by a long shot. What are the steps we can take um, that are being taken to get uh, to address this in Kitsap and beyond? I have some colleagues and was invited to participate in um, over at Payscale, which is a company that's used globally um, for HR and benefits and cost comparisons over in Seattle. So we went over there and we, we talked primarily about closing the gap in compensation and in providing opportunity and access. Um, so it's happening quite a bit in Seattle. I think that it's not happening nearly enough here in Kitsap. Uh, this is a, a conversation I'm pretty passionate about. I would love to have underrepresented communities partner up with people in tech, especially those who are, of us who have been executives, who have leadership um, capabilities and responsibilities, we can, and so I'm looking at, at our tribe, we can, we can make this better. We can improve this. Here's specifically, Catherine, here's one of the things that we can do. We can create online opportunities for mentorship, for, for communities, for webinars that can give them the tools and the mentoring and the projects to accomplish this. Um, it's a big uh, opportunity, but I think when you have the right people trying to solve that problem, and that's a great problem to solve, um, it can get done. Uh, so I know it's not a specific answer, but I would love to participate in that one. Yeah, uh, and I think it does take a whole community to focus on that. It really um, does. And then here's one for anyone who has their crystal ball working. What do you see our local area looking like in August in regards to groups for meetings, concerts, et cetera? Hmm. Is that a Brett question or is that sort of focused on anybody? I think anyone can answer that as long as their crystal ball is working. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, Scott has a good point and Scott is so well connected to um, kind of the state and, and oh gosh, national and global folks. And Scott and I have worked um, and known each other for quite a while. He's right. That's entirely up to the governor and, and what um, he opens up. Um, proximity and access. Uh, my suspicion is that we, there are things that happen at a very strategic level, like, you know, TED Talks and TED, TEDx um, topical conversations. We could do that. We could do that virtually. We could begin to identify some of those things. Um, there's going to be stuff happening at Vibe. There's always great events that are happening at Vibe. Elena and I talk about um, how, how do we make these just top-notch strategic um, meetups and conversations. I would, this would be a great group to say, I would love to see a webinar or a conference on topic X or Y or Z. Mm -hmm. um, I think Catherine's was a good one. Maybe we could, you know, have a webinar on that. Well, and I think, you know, we're always asking people for topics for these webinars and, you know, we're ready to continue pivoting and figuring out what's the best way to meet the needs of the business community now because for us economic development doesn't look like it did in 2019. Yeah um, and, and on that last one Kathy I think um, and all the work that we've done 
with Kita. There are two, two, and I break it down in in um, the under unqualified manner. So everybody take this with a grain of salt. There's there's hiring or trying to convince big companies to come move over to Kitsap. Economic development, you know, topic one. Economic development topic two is how do we as a community invest in the startups, the entrepreneurs, the value creation. So one is going and getting the crops and bringing them here. The other is helping the crops grow from here. The little seedlings into the small plants into the large trees that then create more seedlings that create more plants that create more trees. I think that we should spend more energy, time, and resources on the second rather than the mm -hmm. first. That, that's what I've always maintained. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll see a lot of economic developments doing that. In fact, the state has a program that they are launching. It'll be on our website if it's not already called um, Thrive. Mm -hmm. So there is stuff going on. There is recognition. We call it business retention and expansion. Mm -hmm and entrepreneurship. So with that, Teresa, I think we're ready for the next um, poll on remote work challenges. So what has been your biggest pain point regarding remote work? Some of you, when you were forced into it, um, juggling working kids, your internet connection, lack of dedicated office space, lack of focus, difficulty communicating with your work team, cabin fever, lack of adult interactions beyond my household, or I am loving this. Okay. Teresa? Oh, look at that. Um, the majority, it's a split between not being able to, you know, have interaction beyond your home and your, everybody's loving it. And then I see some of us did not plan to have ongoing office space in our homes. Okay, thanks guys. And now we're ready to learn more about remote working and maybe some tricks of the trade and what we can learn from that. So Elena Embach, we're happy to turn this over to you now. Hello, hello. Let me see if I can smoothly transition to share screen the way Brett did here. Yay, okay. Can you see my screen? Thumbs up? Yes, okay, cool. Um, so no surprise, I would love to chat a bit about co-working. Um, it's been a funny one. So we've got lots of questions and there's, you see in the headlines, you know, will co-working survive? And, um, it's fascinating to me. And it's one of the reasons that I got excited about co-working to begin with in that co-working is as relevant and as useful, if not more so in times of downturn as it is in times of massive success and everything going well. Um, and I think it's still something that a lot of people are trying to wrap their heads around and understand how it can apply to them and their business and their work. And there's a lot of companies um, who previously had not at all considered co-working and how that fits in with their model. Um, and so this seemed like the perfect time to share a little bit of how it might be applied and what we're seeing you know, in the year and a half since we've been open here in Pulso at Five Cowork. So. Um, I really do think that co-working can be a secret weapon to success right now in um, recovering from a lot of the pain that a lot of businesses um, and freelancers and consultants also are feeling. Um, and a lot of success as we move into this new normal that you know we're trying to figure out, are we going to be able to have groups? When are we going to be able to have groups? Um, let's see if I can move you so I can get to my... Let's see. Got your beautiful faces in the way of my arrows. There we go, try that. All right, um, so co-working, three things that it gives you the power to do. Um, number one, it gives you the power to leverage community and build some really critical connections and strengthen relationships. We'll get into all these in a bit, but I wanted to give you kind of the front, front preview. 
Um, number two, it gives you the chance to get out of the house. It gives you the chance to kill the commute if you're someone who's got long hours worth of commuting time. Um, and a word that we've been hearing quite a lot in the last two weeks or so, um, this word de-densify. So a lot of companies that are trying to figure out, you know, what are the alternatives to packing into public transportation, packing into big offices, packing into the skyscrapers, um, and doing all of that while preserving or improving the health and wellness of us, the people who are doing the work. And then lastly, um, it also gives you the power to reduce costs pretty significantly by paying only for what you're actually needing and using. So you see, you know, all these traditional companies that have built in conference rooms, for example, um, that get used, you know, once a week for the team meeting, alternatively, you could be paying for it just when you need it. Um, so this, for those who aren't familiar with co-working, this is kind of the quick dictionary definition, um, the use of an office or other working environment by people who are self-employed or working for different employers. And the whole idea of this is to, you know, bring people together, bring creativity together and let these ideas um, kind of grow as they collide together. This, um, for those of you who haven't been in Survive, this is just a couple shots of what our space looks like. So, you know, very intentionally designed for productive work. You've got private phone booths to pop into, you've got whiteboard walls, whiteboard tables, and space. Um, you know, as we look at some of these offices where people have been crammed in, um, we've got about 7,000 square feet. And so there's room to move around and change depending on the work that you're doing. Um, this, I was digging this up. This slide is an old one. So this was actually in our original pitch deck um, when we were first, um, you know, shooting around the idea of opening a co-working space here in Palsbo, when we were trying to do our problem identification. And we said, what? What is it that is the pain we need to solve in order to be successful as a co-working space? So number one, um, the loneliness epidemic. People are lonely. There's a lot of people that work from home. There's a lot of people working independently and people miss that camaraderie of a team. Um, secondly, a lot of lost time, um, especially for those who are doing the commute. You're talking three, four hours a day that's spent you know, that you could have back to be spending with your family or doing hobbies or, you know, other, other more fun and enjoyable things. Um, the disconnectedness, same, you know, along the same lines as the lonely that you just, you're constantly in this bubble of your team and miss out on the opportunity to um, get fresh ideas from others that might influence your ideas and ways of thinking. Uninspired, no place to grow. The interesting thing about this is that you know, as much as the world has shifted now in the context of COVID-19, all of these things are as relevant now as they were before. Um, and that to me is really a sign of um, the longevity of co-working and its applicability to our lives, you know, amidst all of the ups and downs that we're experiencing. So um, I wanted to be sure to flag that here in Kitsap, we have a lot of choices on co-working spaces. So there are now, what's that, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, if you also add in Port Townsend, so you've got the collab out there. Um, so that's exciting. And it also gives people, you know, options to find something that's close to home, find something that feels right to be a good fit in terms of the community, the people, the space. Um, and if we go back to kind of those three pieces of how co-working can really be a secret weapon, the first thing you really have to understand is that community is the key to recovery. So as much as it, you know, the physical distancing has been isolating, um, we, need, we need each other now more than ever. Um, and especially, you know, in the context of larger companies trying to figure out what their game plan is going to be now, they're not looking to you know, take out more leases, purchase more assets, grow in bigger spaces, they're suddenly trying to figure out how they can have the most flexible solutions that their team members, their workers are wanting. And co-working fits right in with that. Um, we actually, right as everything was kind of shutting down, we put a survey out to our members to kind of help us gauge and understand the impact that co-working was having on their lives. 
And these numbers are so telling to me. Um, so this is 73% of people who responded said that in the time they've been co-working, they've made new professional connections. 70% say that they're more productive. People are happier, people are more focused, people have made new friends and people feel less stressed. So, you know, again, that was at the beginning of the stay at home order. Um, you can only imagine if those were things that were important results for people in normal times, um, why it's even more important to get back to um, being connected with each other through co-working spaces now. Um, and this, you know, this again underscores the same, the same idea. The biggest change in my life since I started co-working is my ability to be fully present at work and then go live life. I have my time back. And I think that's the number one thing that I've been hearing <clears throat> from people recently, and we're seeing it in the headlines, is that challenge of just your, the actual number of hours that you're working at home feels longer because it's so broken up and interrupted by all of the other things you're trying to manage in the household, doing distance learning for school, cooking meals, you know, everything that entails with having the whole family together. So when we look into the crystal ball and kind of anticipate the future, we know that, you know, you, your employees, your colleagues, everyone is going to be eager to have more options, not necessarily that people aren't liking working from home, but having alternatives to, to get out and work productively in as well. Uh. Um, and the other piece that, you know, Brett really spoke to as well is that the power of that network. So in that same impact survey that we put out, um, we asked people how often they had referred, hired, or partnered with another Vibe member. And this is what it came out to. So 50%, over 50% had referred um, job opportunities or business opportunities to other Vibe members. People had hired them on for their teams. People had partnered up for different projects. And if we talk about, you know, what we're going to need to go forward, that community piece, we're going to need each other more than ever. I'm um, sorry, I'm trying to pop up the, looking at chat at the same time. Okay. Um, this other piece comes back to the de-densifying. So we, um, we ourselves and our businesses and employers are going to really need to get smart about spreading out. Um, I think that's going to be really, really important for the next probably year um, is how do we um, make physical space? Um, we, you know, a lot of the companies no longer want all of their employees in one building. And part of that is a, um, is a security thing for the business as much as it is for the employees themselves. They want their employees to be help, healthy. But what do we do if our entire team gets sick because our singular office space um, became a point of um, spread of disease? So that's something that, you know, I've had calls from a couple people already that work for larger companies that are saying, hey, we're trying to actually place our employees in different places to protect them and protect the business. Um, we also know that working remote from home full time is really, really tough on, on mental health and that we need to be around other people. So again, co-working can provide a great solution for that. Um, the co-working spaces, you know, I think all of them are being required um, both out of their own, you know, moral compasses as much as by actual CDC regulations to do everything they possibly can to make sure that the co-working spaces remain a safe and healthy place to work. Um, so you're going to see a lot of changing protocols, I think, around furniture setup, um, cleanliness, um, you know, head counts, all kinds of things. Um, the other reason that co-working can really be a win right now um, in helping people recover from this is the cost factor. Um, so again, you know, you're not locked into long-term leases. You're only paying for what you actually need to use, um, which means you're either paying by the hour, by the day, or by the month. Um, and you can do that for your team or you can do that for you individually. So this, I just took a quick screenshot from our website to give you a sense of the flexibility available. Um, so we've got five different options for monthly membership in addition to the day passes and hourly conference room rentals. Um, and then again, you know, flexibility is the name of the game. So the setup in terms of being able to move furniture around, being able to space people out, um, co-working spaces are 
that are designed for that. Um, we're looking, you know, talking about density. We run, we've got three, you know, four different conference rooms in a large event space. And we're really looking at um, most of those are below or very near the threshold that they had initially put in place of no more than 10 people together. Um, but in any case, we're looking at, you know, what are the alternative uses of that? Could it be, you know, maybe it's a single person that you, that becomes your office um, and you have that security of space and, and yeah, walkability air. Um, and this also, um, we've just opened a new space in downtown Bremerton called The Spot um, that is completely private. So there's not even, it's not staffed. So we have a cleaning team that goes in before and after every use, but access to the space is um, through an app on your phone. There's a key app on your phone. So you can go in there knowing it's been fully cleaned. There's cleaning supplies there if you want to double up. Um, but you can make that an offsite workspace for you or your trusted team in a way that um, previously just hasn't been possible in traditional offices. So that's kind of the world of co-working. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I think um, it's that community piece that I come back to again and again of we are so much stronger together. And, you know, in the case of co-working spaces, it's never been about the space. It's been about the people. And I think in, in the case of every co-working space here locally, the virtual communities that you've seen thrive over this last month really speak to um, the strength and resiliency and support that people are able to, to get from gathering together. So Kathy, back over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, and there's some comments echoing the virtual gatherings that the co-working spaces have been providing. I think people just want to be with their tribe. They want to be with the folks that they've built relationships with. Um, in a previous webinar, we talked about the virtual um, happy hours, which I know co um, Vibe is doing those as well. Several other folks, Dan Whedon has one, and I'm sure other people have them. Um, so if there are questions that people have, we want to you know, give the, you this opportunity to ask any question, whether it's related to the topic, anything um, that we've covered in the past, um, I will say that, um, oh, Jamie just posted that um, Western Washington University Small Business Development Center, which is what her office is under, is now going to have their weekly webinars on a different day. They've previously been at the same time, so we won't have that conflict. Um, and I think, yes, technology security at Vibe. I that is something that I think we need to address as more and more people are working from home. If Brett or Elena want to sure. discuss that. Uh, Elena, you want me to try to feel that one? Uh, yeah, that would be great. So, um, so Dan posted um, discussing a tech security at Vibe. One of the things that's great about tech, and um, we talked about this early on, and um, I have the privilege of being one of the founding 40 members there, is that um, we have uh, at Vibe, kind of like at being at a Starbucks, you you always, whenever you take your laptop into another location, you're somewhat responsible for your own your own physical and your own digital security. So inside of Vibe, there's a very, it's a powerful network. It's the, one of the fastest networks in all of Kitsap County. So um, there's a firewall that, that connects coming into the network. And then every individual member is responsible for firewalling their own laptop or their own office. So um, if you're doing a lot of the normal stuff, if you have good antivirus going, if you have anti-malware, just doing the normal basic laptop security, you're gonna be just fine. There's so much room. Um, there's a lot of people. In fact, there's even some artificial intelligence programmers that are working for some really high tech companies and their subject matter expertise is so sensitive. They, they work all the time at Vibe. So they uh, just have to be thoughtful to who's over looking over their shoulder. But for the most part, I mean, there's, there's not a digital security, cybersecurity issue there. Elena, do you agree or anything to add? No, you nailed it. Okay. Good. 
Okay, oh, Joe Dietz from Bainbridge um, City Council would like to see Keto lead a discussion on how businesses can open up while maintaining social distancing protocols. Yes, we have been um, noodling on future topics and that is something, you know, about how can we operate in this new environment and still be successful. Okay. There are a lot of, especially retailers, restaurants, service, companies that are really facing some challenging times you know let me let me talk about so one of the things that i think this is just a this area that's so exciting it's kind of like um walking through a field it's just you know the fruit's about to burst sometimes going to leavenworth or wenatchee it, it feels like that so one of those things about problem identification let's think about getting takeout food every restaurant couldn't have anybody coming in so the problem this identified is restaurants are gonna go out of business unless they can keep doing business. Solution, give takeout. Problem is that all of us who need to maintain social distancing, we still wanna have good food. We still wanna be able to support our local uh, restaurants. There's a great opportunity to connect those. Um, Pho TNN here in Paulsbo, great um, uh, Pho restaurant. They, Joe, the owner, um, had actually done the work to set up an e-commerce to put his menu online so that we could order from a phone. Well, for every one of those, there's, I don't know, there's probably a dozen restaurants who didn't. So they're not able to take orders through a phone. So I would love to see some smart people come together who know the restaurant space, who know how to work with programmers, and just create an opportunity to connect the restaurant to, to us, the consumers. If we can make it frictionless, if we can make it fast, if we can be notified when our food is ready, we're not gonna have to be standing there, you know, waiting awkwardly while um, the, the restaurant people try to do their best to uh, serve us. So that's an, a problem to be identified and there's a potential solution to be had. With tech. With tech, tech helps, <laughs> tech connects. <laughs> Uh, Monica, do you want to share any more on what you just posted about the discussion for the COVID-19 safety plan? Uh, sure. Um, I was just um, putting it out there that there are some uh, discussions being had and whether or not OSHA ends up doing it or not is um, we don't know yet, but um, there's some talk about having um, businesses put together a COVID-19 safety plan as people um, begin to return back to the workplace, um, even if it's um, part-time returning back to the workplace, still working from home or other locations and so forth. And so um, there are some plans out there um, that you can Google and kind of um, take a look at. I know the state of Minnesota actually published a template um, that they um, find as an acceptable one for their businesses in Minnesota. Washington, I don't believe, has um, put any guidelines out yet about that. Um, and also SHRM um, has a, a pretty good in-depth checklist on our on the West Ham Workforce LinkedIn page. I also put up a quick checklist. Those are things that help jog um, your thought process um, as businesses begin to open up and how you can do so safely with um, keeping um, you know, good intentions in mind uh, as far as your employees' health um, from a physical standpoint as well as emotional and, and uh, mental. So um, just be aware of that um, as, it, as things kind of come back to whatever nor new normal is going to be out there. Yes, it's not going to be the old normal for sure. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> no. I know that um, Teresa has been, you know, resourcing and posting tons of different articles and resources on our COVID page and the blog. She's probably posting between four and 10 um, things on our blog daily. They all go straight to Twitter and then I will pick up some of them and post on others. So we are doing our part to at least get the information out there. And if you have something that you think we've missed, please send it to either myself or Teresa um, so we can get that word spread. I see KJ noted that another um, local restaurant is using an, an online platform as well, one of the Thai restaurant in Pulsebo. Uh, 
Dan's noting that he creates COVID-19 plans. So, um, and actually Kita just finished, um, we're working with him to finish ours up. Let's see, my coffee helper is an app. Oh, has anyone heard of that? My coffee helper? That's great. For, for coffee and food delivery. Um, and I have seen some other things. So maybe that's something that, you know, can be a little side project for us is, you know, what are the, the programs or the apps that are not going to take so much from the company that it's not worthwhile for them to utilize? Because I've heard a lot of pushback yeah. on the food delivery apps. Well, you know, the interesting thing too is I, um, the food delivery apps in some ways are getting sort of a bad, um, a bad rap. Um, they're trying to solve a problem, but when you take it to rural America or you take it to smaller communities, it just doesn't work that well. So um, the many of us are willing to drive over to a restaurant and, and get the food and have the majority of that profit go to the, the restaurant who are already operating on a pretty thin margin. So I, but however, they don't want to be tech experts. So that, that's something that most of us who are longtime tech people, we know that it's important to let the people who are good at the business be great there. Don't become a technology nerd. Like, you know, turning a great chef into a tech nerd is a bad idea. So if we can come up with some solutions that help, you know, all of their amazing food get to, you know, all of their customers or more, then that's a win-win. But I think 20% of, of uh, you know, whatever the delivery fee is that, you know, might go to the platform, that's just too much. It, it needs to be a, a, a more efficient method to give to those people, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mickey from the Bainbridge Chamber noted that there's a, an app called Island Bite for Bainbridge that will take orders and deliver for several of their restaurants. Oh, good. I would love to see one that's countywide. Um, just to make it easier for folks to find things in one um, place. Uh, Jamie, do you want to weigh in on what SBDC can help these folks as they are thinking about a pivot? Yeah, well, I mean, just generally in restaurants, it's been really interesting to see the people that have reacted quickly um, you know, to this new world, ones that may not have been quite set up um, to do what they need to do. And I would say for those of um, people who are sort of tech averse and, you know, when they hear that word, they think, oh no, I don't know anything about that. Just think about it in terms of um, problems you're trying to solve. And, um, and then it, I think it'll be easier to navigate, you know, um, what happens, whether it's an app or whether it's installing plexiglass or whatever. But it's been fun because I've seen restaurants who had no idea how they were going to handle this and have gradually made improvements. And it's, I think it's been really fun for some of the local restaurants, they have a place where they ask you to um, put in, you know, you pay online, you order online, all great. And then they ask you to put in the, um, the color and description of your car um, or something distinctive that you're wearing so they can just walk out and hand it to you and you never have to, you know, go in the building. You know, but I think, um, so there's, you know, a couple of things I've heard here that are just really great and I'm sure are going to happen is we need to have a good source to go to, um, to, to find a list of every place that is available right now and make sure we're supporting the people that are being resilient and reaching out and adapting, you know, to this new world. Um, and then, you know, helping others, other restaurants to, to join that, but, but how do we share that information? And then the other thing, like I said, is, you know, for any of you, you know, there's, um, there's uh, all sorts of resources as, you know, Brett and Elena have been talking about and Dan and, and whoever and the SBDC, you know, um, we're here to help you just figure out your situation and, um, you know, how you can, you know, it's never going to go back to 2019, you know, we're in a new world. And so how can we help you navigate that and survive and thrive in that new world? So a lot of resources for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mickey just made a great point um, that many of the companies that she's working with on Bainbridge who she says should have been doing e-commerce are now online and you know making shipments globally and you know I don't maybe that's something we also need to touch on whether it's through SBDC, KEDA, the chambers that you know what do you need to do to have a successful e-commerce site and business because that is the way it's going to go. Um, <laughs> 
Let me, can I just make one comment about that specifically? If you're thinking about exporting, we have people, you know, I'm part of, it's a Washington state network. So you're part of all of the business advisors in the whole state, you have access to them. And we have um, two people that all they do is work internationally on um, exporting um, um, businesses that want to become exporters. So you don't, I don't know a, a whole lot about that, but I would bring in the person that can help you navigate that. And we've got some great success stories from Washington State just by working through the SBDC, getting your free export, you know, resource that'll hold your hand through this whole process. So that's my two cents. <laughs> okay. I'm, oh, okay. Has anyone, we have somebody talking about Patreon. Um, is there anyone who's familiar with Patreon on the panel? Uh, I, I can speak to it. So Patreon is, um, uh, many people are familiar with Venmo. So Venmo is a way that if um, uh, Elena buys lunch and then I say, and then I pay her back, I can send her $5 via Venmo. So it's just sort of a quick way to send money back and forth. Patreon is a little bit different in that if I'm doing something as an artist, typically, then Patreon is a way that I can just um, put, give little donations, little microtransactions that are actually real money to that, um, that particular artist or, or individual. It's different than a GoFundMe and it's different than um, you know, some of the Kickstarter campaigns. It's just saying, hey, if you like what I'm doing, just here's a quick way to, uh, to show the love and give me just a, just a little tip. Yeah, and it seems to go cover all industries from what I've yeah. seen. Yeah, and, it, and it's not even an industry specific thing. It's just a technology. It's a, it's a simple way to give a little microtransaction to a person. So if you think about it, if I write a song, I, I'm a terrible singer, so this is a laughable analogy. But if I, if I wrote a song and then um, I posted that song up on YouTube and then I have my Patreon link, then you all could say, that was a great song and everybody gives me a quarter. Well, if a million people give me a quarter, that gives me enough oxygen to be able to write another song. So sort of that's the... That's the idea. No, I love the concept. <laughs> so, so Scott wants me to sing a song right now. <laughs> and I can see. <laughs> well, we, yeah, we so. are almost out of time. but uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> uh, I'm, get so you for that, Scott. I, I'm getting some affirmation on somebody, if not us, someone else doing a class on e-commerce and perhaps you know exporting which is a whole world unto itself and depending on what you're exporting um so i think unless we have any more you know burning questions and we'll um sign off for now any last thoughts elena jamie brett Oh, Teresa, did we have one more? Um, uh, I have one. Go ahead. I have one comment. I was just going to say, um, you have um, access to webinars given by any of the SBDCs around the state. Um, again, so glad to hook you up to that resource and you can look through the webinars that you're interested, in, even if they're not, you know, being hosted at Kitsap SBDC. Okay. And our final I, I, poll. Go ahead, Brett. Uh, I was going to say, um, there, there's sort of a leadership crew that meets often at Vibe, and we're just leaders in our own uh, different um, sectors of the economy. And we have, um, we love where we live, and so we talk about having a great quality of life. We also are ambitious enough and, and perhaps persistent enough that we want to move the needle nationally and per perhaps globally. So I would encourage everyone who's on this call to really start thinking about the problems that need to be solved. There's a lot of problems that don't need to be solved, but there are some definite problems that need to be solved. And the great, we, I like the word tribe rather than silo. In a silo, you don't get in, you don't get out. But a tribe has sort of permeable boundaries. So finding a tribe and having tribes intersect is a good thing. And that, that diversity of thought is a great thing. So get out there and do it. Let's not wait. <laughs> Elena, did you have anything? Um, no, I think just the, I, I appreciate the conversation here and the recognition of where we're at and how hard that's been, um, but also the optimism in that. I think that that golden, the golden age of innovation, like that just kind of captures it all of like, we can, 
let's let's struggle through the toughness of it and then let's like really think outside the box and, and make sure that we've got the support systems in place um, to be able to do that both in finding the resources that we need and just having the, the pure moral human support as well. Right. And then here's our final poll results. And apparently we're all um, having some adult beverages at one point or another. And I will say I am now in love with a new app called Drizzly because it allows me to get my wine from High Spirits delivered to my door. So that was fun. Um, thank you all for joining us. As always, we will post this on our website either later today or first thing tomorrow. And we will see you next week at 10. Thanks all.